And I actually giggle about that a little bit. You know, I've, I've never known a scientist who wasn't a data scientist because if they're not using data, what are they doing? Right? <laughs> so, but it's interesting, you know, some of the terminology I think is, is sort of morphed and changed and you become popular and sort of a fad and then it'll kind of ebb and flow and be called different things. But a lot of the principles I think are still still there and have been there like going all the way back to students tea distribution and the guy measuring Guinness beer in England. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, we have Miles Porter on the show. Miles is an experienced data scientist focused on image processing, time series analysis, and combinatorial optimization opportunities. He is currently a lead data scientist at Trimble Central AI, he holds a BA in math and did graduate work in applied math at Colorado State. He's worked as a consultant at a range of companies such as Medtronic, Best Buy, and Blue Stem Brands. He's also a musician, playing jazz bass and teaching taekwondo. Although, Miles, I would guess, probably not at the same time. <laughs> no. Anyways, uh, I really f- I look forward to our conversation today, and thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, I, I gave a brief intro maybe about where you are today and then also that you studied uh, math in, in college. Um, I actually have an undergrad in math as well. Maybe you can fill in some of the dots for us, though, sort of between those two points in your life. I did get my bachelor's at UNC, and then I went on to Colorado State where I studied um, applied math. And I had a professor there, Michael Kirby, who did a really important piece of work as a, as a graduate student on something called eigenfaces, and you can Google that. But it was really a fascinating thing that he did back in the early 90s, actually, might even have been the late 80s at that point, where he was using people's faces and basically coming up with ways to sort of classify people based on some really fancy linear algebra, matrix kind of math stuff, and something called eigenvalues. But I took this course from him and it really got me fascinated. One of the things we had to do in this course, it was long ago, but neural networks existed at that point. And we had an exercise where we had to create our own neural network from scratch in C. And it was brutal. It was (laughs) brutal. I mean, it's not like you could go into TensorFlow and say, yeah, I want, you know, the atom optimizer and just go. You had to like write the optimizer yourself. But I loved it. I thought it was really great. And that kind of got me really interested in thinking about analytics and math. I took a detour in my career at that point because, you know, you got to live, right? So I got into computer networking and then I went on to do some stuff in uh, at the community college level, just organizing computer networks. And then I ended up in the Twin Cities. And I think maybe like you, I bopped around to a bunch of different companies as first as an employee. I I was one of the first employees at techies.com here. And then I got into more consulting kind of stuff and then eventually ended up at a company called PeopleNet. That was kind of at the height of the IoT time. And PeopleNet was a really cool place to be. PeopleNet has a device that they install in semi-trucks and it tracks the location of the truck and a bunch of information about the truck. So... I worked in that space for a little bit, but I'd always really missed the the analytics piece, the data science piece. We didn't call it that back then, but I really missed that. So at one point in my career, I just kind of said, hey, you know what? At, at the encouragement of my wife, she was like, why don't you do what you want to do? And so I took some time off and started to do my own independent research in data science. I was very fortunate in having some connections back at PeopleNet because they offered me the opportunity to come back and consult as a data science scientist. So I did that. That actually turned into being an employee for PeopleNet, and then that evolved into being part of Trimble, the corporate umbrella for PeopleNet. And working in that uh, corporate group is, the group name is Central AI, and, and being a lead data scientist there. So that's kind of how I got all into it. And then Just to add one thing, I just recently graduated from Georgia Tech with a master's in analytics, too. So I was actually able to kind of finish the graduate work that I had started way back in the early 90s. So, 
it's great to be oh, done. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, no, that's, I mean, very proud of you to sign a, kind of come, come back, I guess, full yeah. circle, you know, and put in the dedication and the hard work to sort of uh, get that master's degree for sure. It's funny in some ways, you know, again, like I said, my, my undergrad was in math. And back then, I mean, I graduated in the mid 90s. Back then, there didn't feel like the most, most of the math careers were either actuarial science, you know, basically going to grad school and being a professor or teaching somewhere or nothing else, right? It didn't, it didn't feel like, or I don't even know if this whole term data science really, you know, existed or was well known. And certainly not, you know, machine learning and AI were areas that a mathematician would drop into back then, it felt like. I don't know. Did, did you, you feel the same way? Yeah, you know, back then there was this field called operations research, and it still exists the INFORMS group, and, and I'll be speaking actually at an INFORMS conference coming up in April that's sort of like the, the interest group for operations research. That's, that's out there, and that has been there for a, for a very long time. And I think a lot of what we do bumps into that kind of stuff, operations research. You know, a lot of data science, too, in the past, it's had other names. It's, it's been sort of maybe disguised as things, but I think you could make the argument that some of Six Sigma could be considered data science. You know, if you look at the Demaic sort of paradigm, the define, measure, analyze, improve, control, well, define, measure, analyze, improve sounds a lot to me like the scientific method, and that's the underpinnings of data science, right? If you can't really call it science unless you're doing the scientific method. And I actually giggle about that a little bit. You know, I've, I've never known a scientist who wasn't a data scientist because if they're not using data, what are they doing? Right? Yeah, so, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of kind of redundant. Yeah, some of the terminology, I think, is, is sort of morphed and changed and, you know, popular and sort of a fad, and then it'll kind of ebb and flow and be called different things. But a lot of the principles, I think, are still still there and have been there like going all the way back to students t distribution and the guy measuring guinness beer in england so using statistics using math to sort of model the real world and then taking that model and trying to make descriptions or predictions or prescriptions back in the real world has always been there well for a long time for sure i mean one one of the things that you know you you had shared that interests you is i mean obviously probability and statistics you know some of the some of like the core underpinnings i guess of mathematics but how then does the analytic side of that relate to these broader terms that people use like ai and machine learning and deep learning yeah you know it's really interesting cuz i went back and i listened to uh, a couple of the podcasts and there's some some really interesting uh, and great insights back there. But I was struck by how people have kind of different mindsets based on where they're coming from and the problems that they're solving. I'll share with you mine, and it's probably going to be largely informed from academia just because I just finished my master's. But I sort of think of it this way, and I'm a visual person, so I'll sort of describe it to you and you can sort of, maybe your listeners can draw it out. But if you draw a circle and you cut it into three parts, like the Mercedes-Benz sign, that represents analytics. And the upper left-hand corner, that's AI. And inside of AI, you're going to have machine learning, which is a subset of that. And then inside of machine learning, you're going to have supervised and unsupervised machine learning and now self-supervised machine learning, which is a new kind of thing. And then inside of supervised machine learning, you'll have deep learning. So that's in the upper left-hand corner. The upper right-hand corner, I think of that as simulation. And at the very bottom, I think of that as probability and statistics. You know, if you pick it apart, it can break down because probability and statistics are absolutely critical to simulation. And you absolutely have to have probability and statistics, particularly if you're doing any kind of like metrics for accuracy in artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, any of those kinds of things. But that's sort of my, my universe. Another thing that, if I made it even simpler, if you Google NVIDIA deep learning and then you go to images, I think the first image that you'll find is like this really cool graphic that has a time scale at the bottom. And it has, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and then deep learning sort of in a chronological order. I think I kind of relate to that too. But I still think about analytics as being even bigger than that. Interesting. Like I said, it's even bigger than that, right? So the, this analytics field sort of encompasses all of these areas that you're talking about. Yeah. And the, the three things you said was AI, simulation, and then probability and statistics. Was that, that was the third one? Yeah, and I'm a real stickler about that probability and statistics thing 
because they're, they're so fundamental. There's this really important concept. And I always ask people in interviews this question. And it's amazing how, how often people don't give me the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> but sometimes I'll say, what's the difference between probability and statistics? And the answer is really pretty straightforward. If you're doing probabilities, what you're really doing is you have a population and you're trying to make some kind of statement about, now, if I grab a sample, a subset of that population, how likely is it that I'll have, you know, I have 6 million marbles. How likely is it if I pick 100 that I'll have five red ones? That's a probability question. Statistics goes the other way. So I have a sample and I have five red marbles and three green marbles. And I think there are a million, you know, in the population. And typically what you'll do with statistics is you'll have more than one sample. So I can't count all the million. So I'll get 15 samples of size 10. What kind of things can I do to sort of reason back the other way? So can I use the little sample to make statements about the population? So those are, that's the difference. And sometimes when you hear people talk about probability and statistics, that technically the terms are not interchangeable. And I don't know that the terminology is really important, but it's the, this idea of going from the big to the little and the little to the big that I think is so critical. So critical. It is part of the underpinning of machine learning too, right? I mean, if you do a classification problem, right, you could theoretically try to count everything and then just classify things that way. But sometimes we can't know the population. And so that's when you start to use tools to sort of predict, you know, okay, based on these training samples, what do I think the population is going to have? And there you are, you know, at an artificial intelligence machine learning kind of scenario. No, I love that. I love that viewpoint. I've, I, I've actually never heard that before. It's, it's kind of like, what do you know today and what are you trying to move towards in probability? Like you said, you, you want to figure out like, what's the likelihood? It's more of a prediction, it seems like, you know, if, like you said, if I reach inside here, what's the likelihood yep. I'm going to grab these marbles? I, I love that. Mm -hmm. And then, hey, I, here's, the, here's the people that I find. Kind of like, I mean, I'm just, again, I'm just sort of like spitballing, but, you know, think of COVID today, right? So there's these tests that are being done. So that's hard data that we have with regards to people that are actually testing positive. But now we need to try and go the other way. Like we know there's a lot of people out there that aren't being tested, that aren't, aren't basically showing up. And so what's the likelihood that the entire sample size is, is X? Kind of like, what are you solving for, for X, I guess, right? Right. And there's some really interesting tools out there actually to kind of help you get to those kinds of statements. That's a whole, particularly those kinds of questions when you're dealing with disease and the likelihood of infection and not infection and things like that. There's a, a thing called Bayesian statistics that's sort of, pioneered by, the, by this guy, Bayes. And if you're interested, you can look into that as an interesting little area of stati statistics. You know, there are people that really buy into that Bayesian statistics philosophy, and there's a whole bunch of machine learning tools out there to kind of help you use that Bayesian stuff. I'll tend to get off in the weeds, so you're going to have to pull me back. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, 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 it's good. We got listeners from, you know, all sorts of skill sets and backgrounds here. So I can definitely go in and geek out as much as we want for sure on this stuff. And you, you, you mentioned like regression and like traditional analytics. Is that kind of what you do in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah. So I have my dream job. It's kind of cool um, in working in Trimble. So the, the Trimble, the organization, you may have heard of Trimble Navigation. We originally started out doing just geospatial GPS or sort of the bigger term GNSS for positioning. And what happened with Trimble is we continue to expand and expand. And now we have businesses like the PeopleNet business, which is we now call Trimble Transportation. We do stuff in agriculture. We do stuff in, of course, geospatial, a lot of stuff in construction. There's all kinds of applications with the technology. So in my job, on any given day, I might be talking with people in New Zealand about a construction problem, and then people in Germany about agriculture, and then maybe somebody up in Canada about forestry. And so the problems are very, really widely varied. And then within our central AI group, we actually have divided ourselves into folks that are particularly focused on deep learning and computer vision problems, and then everything else. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm the lead data scientist for that everything else. Now, there's a lot of overlap, and I have peers in the, in the deep learning side that are absolutely brilliant and, you know, frequently, thank goodness, help me out when I get in over my head on some of these problems. But... 
just because of the, the type of work that I do, I will typically focus on the non-deep learning problems. And so that can mean anything from exploratory data analysis. So being in a central group, sometimes we have people come to us and say, here's my data, give me insights. And it's like, okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's take a step back. And yeah, we, yeah. the first thing we always do is start off with exploratory data. Because, it, it, you know, it's like everybody's data is kind of like their kid. Everybody thinks their kid is beautiful, right? <laughs> so you, you got to kind of go into the data and kind of peel it apart and say, hey, let's look at this data. Do you have outliers in your data? Do you have collinearity in your data? Do you have missing data, bad data? And I make, I make a big distinction between bad data and outlier data. How is that? So outlier data is data that is, is probably right, but just doesn't fit in the context of everything else. Bad data is like you have a field structured in your database to be a string, but really it's containing floats. And then you come across like some crazy ASCII characters in there. So it's like impossible data, data that doesn't make any sense. It's like, sure. you know, it, the wrong types kind and, of thing. And are those typically things that maybe it's a sensor or something like that, that was an incorrect Yeah, read? sometimes it's sensors. Sometimes it's just, you know... In some of these huge data pipelines, you have enough moving pieces going around in there. Sometimes you just get data that gets corrupt. I came across one the other day that I was really, I thought was fascinating. We have these handheld devices that are used all over the world, and we have a database that our customers can agree to, to log information into the database. And I was looking through the database where we were capturing the error message, and I was like, oh my, look, I, I've figured out how to say null pointer exception in 67 different languages because it was in there in <laughs> German and English and French and Japanese and Korean. So I don't know, the, the data stuff I think is always really interesting. And that we do this thing called the data quality report. And that always is a very helpful thing when we engage with our businesses because it starts, it starts them thinking really in the details about their data. And sometimes what they kind of thought they wanted us to engage with them to sort of explore. Turns out they dig into their data and go, oh, whoa, what's that? That's really interesting. We should explore that. So that exploratory data analysis, I think, is a is a very helpful, handy tool. And a lot of times it's just plain old statistics. You don't even need to get into any of this other stuff, really, yeah. when it comes to machine learning and neural nets. Yeah, and we typically end up getting there, but it's just sort of, you know, to, to start out with a really good thing. The other thing that I think is really interesting and, and I probably, you might be aware of this too, having been in the IoT space, is that sometimes when you come up with these really cool, sophisticated models, particularly deep learning models, sometimes they don't work so well in the IoT space, right? So if you have like a sensor that's detecting anomalies, say, you may want to manufacture that sensor as cheaply as possible. And as a result, you may favor some kind of machine learning model, like, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan big fan of uh, one-class support vector machines, which is just a way to do anomaly detection. But support vector machines are really, really lightweight. And you can kind of deploy that on an IoT device and it'll work really, really well. Whereas if even if you tried to deploy even like a three-layer completely connected neural network, you know, it's just going to take, for one thing, it's going to take a long time to train it. And for another thing, it's going to even take time in inference mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's funny that you mentioned that. I actually interviewed a guy just uh, last week, and he'll be on a, the uh, podcast here, dealing a lot in the industrial IoT space. You know, he was saying that a lot of these, in particular, just like actuators or, or motors, they don't want to increase the cost, number one, very much. And then also, it's, you know, you, you can do pr some prediction before these things are going to fail, right? This is kind of what, what the whole deal is. But he's like, you know, it can be very, very simple. Like, you know, you basically can use statistics and some sort of a regression analysis to basically say, hey, once it, once the voltage falls out of this envelope, you know, like this this window, then there's going to be a problem. And he's like, you don't, do not need to like, you know, like you're saying, sort of like deploy a neural net on, you know, at the edge on this thing. It can be very, very lightweight, which is kind of what they want in those in those spaces. So sometimes it's like, you know, kind of like use the right tool for the right time. Right. There's things like, control charts that were popular maybe back in the in the 80s and 90s for for um, industrial processes that are really work for a lot of things sometimes i think people sort of gloss over some of those in in favor of some of the more i'll say sexy neural networks yeah. <laughs> i think neural networks are cool i just the other day i wrote i was playing around with neural network i had to do a time series problem for one of our groups 
it's a really interesting problem of trying to classify a set of time series. So, you know, time series is just measurements across a time domain, right? And I was like, well, I want to, I want to do something for this person, but I don't really want to solve the problem for them, but I want to do something that I could kind of maybe do a blog post on or something. So I was like, well, hmm, what kind of time series could I create? And then I was like, oh, I know. So I don't know if you're familiar with OpenAI Gym, but it is a reinforcement learning framework that you can use. And it's based on video games. So because I'm older than dirt, I remember the video game called Lunar Lander. And Lunar Lander basically had a left thrust, a right thrust, and a bottom thrust. And you tried to land this little thing on the surface of the moon. And you had this constraint of you can't run out of fuel, but if you land too fast or at the wrong angle, you blow up. I was like, okay, I've got it. Here's how I'm going to do my time series. I'm going to just look at the velocity in any direction, just the speed of that lander. And I'm going to create a bunch of time series. I'm going to have two classes. I'm going to have a reinforcement learning neural network that I'm going to train to land the thing. And then I'm going to land the thing. And then I'm going to see if I can use this time series model to classify between the two. Well, one of the problems is I'm so bad at playing the game that it was just painfully obvious. So I, finally I said, okay, I'm not going to have me do it. I'll train another reinforcement model. So I had five different guys, you know, guys. I had five different agents land the lunar lander from the super expert to the super novice, which was even better, still better than me, and then use that for the time series stuff. So I don't know. I, it, I'm just sort of mentioning this because I think the reinforcement learning stuff is really, really cool, and I really enjoy that. I don't get to do too much of that in my daily job. So I sort of figured out a way to create a problem for it. Well, uh, yeah, are you kind of talking about unsupervised learning versus supervised learning as well when you say reinforcement? Yeah, so reinforcement learning is really kind of an interesting phenomenon. I'm, I'm not really sure if you would classify it as supervised or unsupervised or maybe self-supervised. But what it is, is you basically have the neural network try to play the game. And if it fails or if it succeeds, you either give it a reward or a sort of a punishment. And so you're kind of doing this. And because we have computers now that are super, super fast, we can do this kinds of thing. You know, I can train that model a couple million times and eventually get the thing to actually learn how to land the lunar lander. Some of the reinforcement learning models will use just like the image of the screen as the sort of input vector, right? Others will use more detailed information about like, I wasn't doing the input of the screen. I was just saying the position of the lunar lander and its velocity and angle and stuff like that to kind of make the training a little bit more simple. But these are, you know, reinforcement learning. And, and again, it's sort of, I think it sort of falls in that gray area between supervised and unsupervised. And I would consider it maybe self-supervised learning um, because sure. you do have a reward punishment kind of thing, but you don't have like in, in supervised learning this de facto knowledge of here's your training set with your labels. Yeah, exactly. Everything's been cleanly labeled. And in these cases, you're still, you still are exploring. Like you said, it's like, Hey, you're nudging closer and closer to this thing. So here's, here's a reward. You're getting close <laughs> right? or you're right. getting away, you know, yeah. away from it. So change your weights or balances or whatever it would be, I guess. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting area too. I mean, I think one of the other key differences between the space that I'm in and the deep learning space is that in the models that I do, the data sets tend to be smaller and we tend to be able to do a lot more towards explainability than you can do with some of the really sophisticated deep learning models. You know, it's kind of hard to explain, you know, like a 55 million node neural network as to why it does what it does. But if you have like a random forest or a decision tree or a support vector machine, it gets a little bit easier to sort of explain and it gets a lot easier to reproduce, which is something that is, it can potentially be meaningful. You know, I was, I was enjoying Mike Hugo's podcast a while back. And, and when he was talking about a lot of the things that they do in, in pharmaceuticals, you know, and I know he's spent some time at Medtronic too, but, you know, being able to thoroughly explain what you're doing, why you're doing it. And the outcome is really, really critical, particularly in the eyes of the FDA. So yeah, it's a challenging sure. problem. Yeah. And, and, you know, my experience doing a fair amount of stuff with TensorFlow is just, there's so many knobs you can turn and, and you're right. It is difficult to know, oh, I turned this knob now all of a sudden it did this. Well, why? Right. Because it's, it is kind of a black box 
you're trusting a lot of the a lot of the math going on under the covers, I guess, right. um, that it's just sort of working. And that can be problematic. You know, like if you do any kind of neural network optimization and you use any kind of like stochastic gradient descent or anytime they use that word stochastic, that just means random. And if it's truly random, it gets really hard to repeat. Um, <laughs> you know, you can set seeds and stuff like that. But like I have, you know, colleagues in the deep learning space that are like, yeah, I can do a set seed, but you know what? It does. It's still crazy because there's so many random number generators sitting down below the covers that it's really hard to make sure you absolutely recreate everything precisely the same every single time. For sure. Well, what are what are some some projects that you've been working on recently? You know, I guess one of the the first ones that I did, well, I'll start with maybe sort of the recent ones and kind of work backwards. So I am working on a project right now, really interesting project that is really more analytics, but actually does involve machine learning. And that is something called S-curves. So if you ever imagine a construction site and you think about over the course of that construction site, the company that's building whatever it is has costs that they have to pay for. They have to pay labor, they have to pay for materials, so on and so forth. If you were to graph out over the course, over the time of that construction project and the cumulative, the cumulative cost there is um, this group called the PMI, the Project Management Institute, that has talked about how that graph forms something called an S-curve. And it looks like an S-curve or a logistics curve. And there's a whole bunch of articles out there about why that happens and how that happens. There's even books written on it. So if anybody that ever takes construction project management probably has come across this stuff. And, and so one of the things that construction companies really should try to do is they should try to figure out ways to manage their projects in a way to get that S-curve. But construction projects typically don't happen that way. They typically happen by project managers or four people on site that are managing the project that are doing it a lot more by gut. And so what we are attempting to do in Trimble is we have in our construction business a product where we help our customers capture all the information associated with construction projects, including cost. And this data tends to be pretty accurate because the construction companies will use that data for tax reporting. So it kind of has to be right. What we are able to do is then take and kind of figure out those S curves. Now, where the machine learning part of that comes in is that if I have an S curve, you can follow this process of doing something called a logic transformation. But essentially, you, you apply a mathematical function to the X and the Y value. And you can turn your S into a line. Because of the way that that transformation works, if you know the line, you can go back to the S. Well, the cool thing about the line is that, like any line, it has two things that can be used to describe it, an intercept and a slope. If I can look at the intercept and the slope of that construction project, then one of the things that I can do is look on a graph of a company and see the slope and intercept of all of their construction projects over time. And based on where those individual, so in that graph, each construction project is a dot. If I look at that graph, I can say, oh, here, projects over here to the right are really slow to get started, right? They start and they chug along, 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 and then it's a mad dash at the end. And then there are other ones maybe over to the left that start and they shoot way up and they do a lot of work, but then they don't close the project out. So in each of these cases, the construction project is not functioning optimally. But what we can do in Trimble is we can take all of this data. The way ML comes in is I take the, you know, I take the S curve, get the line, and then I fit a regression, a linear regression, just a simple regression to that, to get that X and Y. But I can do that for these construction company projects and then show that information back to the customer. And then you can do some really cool things with this graph. You can say, okay, let's color code the dots based on the project manager. Do you have some project managers that are always in the sweet spot in the middle and some that tend to be going left or right? Let's color code it based on the zip code. Let's color code it based on the type of project. Is this a heavy highway project or is this like some kind of specialty subcontractor? Is this government buildings or is this residential construction? And you can do, you know, lots of other things. One of the things I've been most recently doing is looking at this in terms of time. So you imagine you got this scatter plot of all these dots. Well, what if you had a little slider at the bottom and you could say, 
I'm going to add these dots gradually over time. Are my projects starting to drift? And it's kind of interesting because like in one of the recent ones that I could see, the dots start to drift off to the right. And the reason why is because of supply chain problems. So they're not able to get product in. They're not able to actually account for that cost. And so the project starts dragging on and on and on and on. That's a real analytics focused kind of thing, but I like it because it's really applied. I mean, the customers love that kind of thing to be able to dig into their data like that. When you mentioned construction data, you mentioned costs. Is there other things that Trimble has out in the field to, to capture some of this stuff like sensors or if you ever go by a construction site and you see a guy standing there with a pole with a dish on the top that's trimble we make like 90 percent of the market share of those kinds of things so we have all kinds of information about the survey location of the construction site i don't know if, if you google spot google trimble spot you'll see the boston robotics dog with the, the with the uh 3 point scanner for a head. Actually, our, our headquarters, uh, this is a funny story, our headquarters is in Westminster, uh, Colorado. And I was out there for a meeting and I was walking down this one floor and I walked into this floor and I looked over and here in like this cube bay is like eight of these spot dogs with the little <laughs> trimble heads on them. And I was like, oh man, this kind of feels like the Terminator. I mean, it was a little scary. You don't realize how big those dogs are. They're big. But anyway, the, the idea there is that those robots will wander around a construction site and create a 3D point cloud. And then, you know, we do things like 3D point cloud segmentation. And we use all of that kind of data to modeling. One of the things like when the, the Notre Dame Cathedral burnt down, they, they used Trimble to create a 3D point cloud of the structure that remained both inside and outside the cathedral. And then they use that information to help figure out how they were going to do the construction and rebuild the spire and things like that. So, oh, awesome. Yeah, there's all kinds of point cloud data out there. That's sort of the physical construction part, but then also for the business part, there's all kinds of data. You know, we really do help our customers from, from the very beginnings of design and BIM and layout for construction sites through actual building the thing with our viewpoint uh, division that, that, that really tracks construction projects and kind of helps those companies manage their projects. So it's a really, really rich space. And and again, it's one of the neat things about Trimble. That's just one little part, but we have similar kinds of things in transportation and agriculture, and natural resources and stuff. So, Sure. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear about another one, but I, I, got, a I got a question about S-curves. Like, it, it, is that something that you uncovered internally? Was it like a customer saying, hey, I really wish I could have this? You know, how, how, what was the process around sort of coming up with this stuff? Yeah, so the S-curves, the idea of S-curves is really well known and it was well known to our division. So they were okay. the first ones. They have this idea, anybody that's maybe studied a little bit of business understands this concept of something called WIP or work in progress. And it's part of sort of your accounting process to think about raw materials and work in process and manufactured product and accounting for all of that kind of stuff. But being able to quantify this work in process is really important. So the, the business knew about it and they were like, well, we want to try to apply this. And it was a kind of a neat opportunity because I was like, oh, cool. I don't know about that, but I'm going to go find out about it. So I did some research. There's several guys out there. I say guys just because they're all men. They probably are women. I haven't found any women that are in this field, but I'm sure there are. But anyway, there is a, a couple of researchers out of Cambridge. One of them is AP Kaka and the other one is Kensley. And they've written a bunch of white papers about doing this kind of S-curve analysis. The problem that they ran into is they didn't have enough projects. So for us, it was like, oh, we have tons of projects. We have maybe too many projects. In fact, we got to the point where my coworker and I were looking at the data and we were like, okay, here's three customers. We have to get all of the individual costs associated with their products so, or their projects. So those three customers had 76,000 projects had 2.3 million costs, right? So the data starts to get big and we have to start thinking about big data tools. You know, we use Databricks and Spark to kind of chug all that data and get it to where it's kind of, where we can present it in a UI and make it meaningful. Um, but there's a lot that we do there that isn't, you know, to be really, I think, successful in sort of analytics and data science, you kind of have to be able to wear a bunch of hats. And in that case, it's sort of like, 
you kind of have to put on the DevOps hat to be able to kind of build these tools and figure out how to get all this stuff to talk together and, you know, get it out the door. So cool. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you got another project you wanted to touch on? Sure. There was another one. This was a transportation one that was really fascinating. It's something called Trimble Dispatch Assistant. And so one of the challenges that a transportation fleet has is trying to match their truck drivers and their trucks to possible loads. In order to do that, it's something called a work assignment problem or a combinatorial optimization problem. It's really, really interesting. Sometimes we talk about in data science and in analytics about greedy algorithms. And a, a greedy algorithm is one that sort of does the next best thing without thinking about anything else down the line. And there's some opportunities in this work assignment problem to say, okay, I'm just going to take the best driver. I'm going to take this driver and find his best load. And I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to take the next driver and I'm going to find his best load. And I'm going to do that. That'd be a greedy algorithm. It's not optimal. It's really bad, but it's really a fascinating problem because, you know, some of these on any given day, some of these fleets have lots of drivers and lots of loads. So you might have a hundred drivers and a hundred loads. Well, if you want to think about the number of permutations of a hundred drivers and a hundred loads, it's actually a number greater than the assumed number of atoms in the universe. It's huge. So figuring out ways to solve that problem is kind of fascinating. Actually, just even getting to the number of saying, if I have to quantify this driver carrying this load, I need to put a number on that. Well, that's a really complicated problem too, because you have to start thinking about, you know, there's this thing called ELD, which is electronic logs for drivers and rules that drivers have to follow for the number of hours that they can drive. You have to think about the distance. You have to think about, you may not want to have this driver take this load. Maybe they can't because maybe it's a hazmat load and they're not able to do it. Just coming up with that matrix is one thing. And then using tools to, to use a heuristic to solve that matrix. So basically shuffle the, the rows around in the matrix until the diagonal becomes a minimum is really fun and really interesting. And there's some, some interesting tools out there. There's a, this is actually an operations research kind of problem. And there's a tool set out there called uh, Google OR Tools that has some stuff that you can use to solve it. That's actually how we went about it. But that was a that was a fun project because it sort of started off as we need to figure out how to give this advice to our our customers, and it really went from that phase all the way through to actually implementing the thing and then having it delivered in such a way that people that are working on a fleet management system on an AS four hundred, right? If you remember yes. those things how they can actually tie into this system and somebody that's using a cloud-based solution from Trimble could tie into it too. So that was a fun project. Yeah, when you mentioned about that, I just got to think about, yeah, what, what does the user interface look like? Like, you know, how, how does it break their current state? Because people can build technology and then it, it forces people to try and relearn, and which means likely not so much adoption. You know, you can kind of have these really awesome tools and if people need to change their flow of their job to sort of accommodate to them, I think as we build software and build AI, machine learning, you know, analytics tools, it just, it sort of needs to be sort of complementary to what we do. Yeah. And, you know, that's an interesting thing. One of the things that we did in that, in that system was we said, we allowed the, the fleet manager the ability to say, okay, here's my loads, here's my drivers, click a button, here's our recommended solution. And then the fleet manager can look at that and go, oh, boy, if I take this driver and I make them go here again, they're probably going to quit. So I got to fiddle with this a little bit. But get, allowing the human to sort of step in has been really, really huge and I think helpful. There was another project kind of similar, well, in, in transportation that we did that had to do with, this is a, a, a thing called IntelliView. But if you have a semi-truck going down the road, it has sensors inside of it that will detect a collision or a potential collision situation. And those sensors are typically based on LIDAR or radar. Now you could go out and theoretically get a bunch of uh, potentially self-driving trucks, you know, but a lot of times fleets don't want to spend multiple billions of dollars replacing their entire fleet. They got to try to do business with what they have. So for a very large logistics company, trucking company, they have these trucks going down the road the problem was if the trucks go under an overpass or next to a big billboard, the sensors go crazy and they think that the truck is going to get in a wreck. 
Well, not a big deal, except that it triggers a video to be recorded, a forward-facing video off the front of the truck, and they do that for insurance purposes a lot of times. That video then goes back to uh, a safety manager in a fleet, and they have to review those videos. The videos are 20 seconds long. And for one of our biggest customers, it was resulting in 80,000 videos that they had to watch in a month. That's like all you did. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And most of them were, you know, false alarms. So what we did was we took the videos and then used deep learning technology to essentially watch the video, do object detection and classification and get a little bounding box on the, on the person. And then based on the size of that bounding box and the location of that bounding box and some other special secret sauce that we have in there, we were able to then make a recommendation back to the fleet manager, hey, really watch this video. But if there were others, we let them see them all, but we could bubble those ones that seemed to be the most critical up to the top. That was a fun one. I worked on that with a colleague of mine, Ann Hunt, and we were able to get a patent on on part of, you know, not the deep learning neural network part, but the overall system part, particularly how we were able to define the bounding boxes and all these other kinds of pieces in there. So that was another fun one too. Really cool. Really, really cool. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that you mentioned you found your dream job. It definitely, definitely sounds like that. If you look back, are you glad you still sort of took that foray into to software and development and now sort of oh, came yeah. back or are you kind of wishing, oh man, I wish I would have jumped into this no. uh, in the 90s? No, I'm really glad that I did it because it just, when you do data science, you know, being able to talk to the business and understand their problems is really important. But the further that you can carry the ball towards solution, the better off you're going to be. So, you know, it's great if you can do do a linear regression in R, that's fine. But if you can do a linear regression in R and then translate it to Python and then put it inside of a Flask app running in a Docker container and deploy it to Azure and then secure it with two-factor authentication or some other kind sure. of authentication and then put that out and and then you know maybe do like a really simple 3D or uh, D3 based JavaScript visualization you know maybe you aren't going to ship all that to production but the more real you make it the the more likely people are going to be to oh yeah let's take this and run with it so I would have no skills um, in that area if I hadn't spent a lot of time you know working at a lot of different places on a lot of different problems. So it's not to say you can't get into data science without that, but I'm every day I'm glad. Um, like even the yeah. other day, I was writing some SQL queries on MySQL, and it was like, you know, if I didn't if I didn't know how to do SQL, or if I didn't know how to do a pseudo app install on Ubuntu to get MySQL running, it would be hard to have this conversation. So <laughs> yeah, I, I I think back. I mean, I I tell people one of the best tools I ever learned was VI actually. Oh, right? yeah. It was just like, I mean, the fact that I sat down and learned VI back in the back in the late 90s or whatever, I saved my bacon so many times, you know, log into a Unix system and it's always there, man. And you can always edit whatever you need. And people are like, how do you understand the cryptic, you know, this, that, other stuff? I'm like, you just got to learn it, man. But I'm telling you, it is, you know, I, I don't use it as a day-to-day coding, you know, IDE. Yeah. Um, but man, it. I am so glad. Yeah, it's that always there, that. right? <laughs> it's always there. It's always yeah. there to be used. Well, I, if you're thinking back, just a couple more questions here at the end, but I mean, you know, do you have any advice or classes that people should take? Like if people are just getting into this field, what, you know, as you've, you've explained your journey, what, what, um, what advice would you give to people? Yeah, I think, you know, there's uh, tons of resources out there. And Mike and his webcast mentioned it. Frankly, Justin, I think this series is great to help people listen to videos and uh, podcasts and maybe, you know, the meetups and get Uh interested in an area and just dig into it. I wanted to call out one other podcast. Sabina Staniscu did a podcast on uh, MLOps, basically. That's incredible. That was a great podcast. And I actually, I, I sent her a message and said, thank you for doing that. Now I don't even have to mention that. It's hugely important, but I didn't mention it. But watch, <laughs> look, you know, listen to Subpoena's podcast. And then in terms of resources, I do have some books that I'd recommend. One is this kind of like the baby book for statistical learning. It's just called An Introduction to Statistical Learning. And it's by James Whitten, Hasty, and Tribishani. I have the one that has applications in R. This is the baby book. The daddy book is the elements of statistical learning. It doesn't cover the mathematical foundations of, you know, even the most simple algorithms, right, have some kind of mathematical underpinnings. And if you're curious, 
This is a great book for it. The other one that I would mention, it's kind of expensive, but it's called the Data Mining for Business Analytics. And there's a version of it for Python. This is a really good book because it talks about different kinds of machine learning algorithms, not deep learning, but this will be all of the other like boring stuff like, you know, k-means and support vector machines and regression and decision trees and random forests and boosted trees and all of that kind of stuff. And it's just a really good reference to have, but it'll give you some idea about here's a problem, here's how you can solve it, here's some gotchas. Mm -hmm. And if you get that book, go to page 420 because there is a section that I refer to quite often. So there's this thing called spurious uh, correlations. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh -huh. or not, but if no, you Google so. spurious correlations, it does things like, you know, I was trying to think of some of them, like the divorce rate is highly correlated with the price of blue cheese or something. I mean, it's just sure. like yeah. crazy things. This book has a section in here that talks about not, not necessarily about spurious correlations, but about when you're trying to do predictions on things that are not predictable. You can do tests to show that certain things are random walks. And one of the things that is a random walk is the behavior of the stock market. So if anybody ever tells you they have an algorithm to predict the outcome of the stock market, you can say, hmm, I think there's a statistical test that you can run that says it's a random walk. So anyway, but that's a, that's a really good book that I'd recommend people check out. And you know, go Jackets, check out the OMSA program at Georgia Tech. So. Okay, <laughs> sure, which is the one that you went through for sure. Yeah. Are you guys hiring within within your group? Not within my group right now, but we will be probably towards the end of the year. And we are, Trimble always has opportunities for people. I saw, we have uh, the a data science job that was posted not too long ago. We have a joint venture with Caterpillar, you know, the big truck things, and they were looking for data scientists in that group. So yeah, you can go to Trimble Careers and, and find all kinds of interesting positions all over the world. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, it seems like it's a hot field, and uh, you you were wise to sort of uh, follow your heart, I guess. You know, in some <laughs> ways, you know, uh, a little bit of luck to, and a whole lot of following my wife's recommendations. I think. What is it? H happy wife, happy life is the is what I like to tell well, people. So yeah, there's a little bit of that. But no, my wife, my wife is a longtime Java contractor in the Twin Cities, and. She's actually a far better programmer than I am, but she, she's the one that kind of really encouraged me to go down this path. So I have her to thank. Yeah. Well, awesome. Awesome. Well, cool. Are there any other topics or things you just wanted to share before we sort of close it out here? No, not really. I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. And thanks again for doing this stuff and helping organize this community. I think it's, I think it's really huge and tremendously important for the Twin Cities and the, and the upper um, Midwest too. Excellent. Well, I know we're going to have you at the meetup uh, the first Thursday in March. This will probably air after that, but we typically record those so people can be able to check you out, talk all about S-curves then. I will obviously, you know, post all your contact information. What What is the best way? You know, are you just, should people find you on LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn works. Miles underscore Porter at Trimble.com works. Um, either of those two ways is probably the best way to get a hold of me. I found your blog, right? Mm -hmm. You you seem like as you've been learning this for a number of years, you've just yeah. been able to just write a lot of blog posts and share. I mean, that, that's so awesome, Miles. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's datascience.netlify.app. For people that ever go and look at that, that really is a journey. You know, when I first started writing that, I had no clue about a lot of things. And then over time, I started to learn more and more and realize how much I don't know, which is kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, one of the fascinating things about this field is that it changes so fast. I was thinking like Hugo was mentioning transformers and BERT and, and all of these things for natural language processing. They're just hugging face and all of these other kinds of things are just coming up constantly. Um, so if anybody ever tells you they know it all, they don't. But it's just cool. I, I just love being feeling like I'm in the stream um, uh -huh. and, and being able to kind of, you know, drink from that stream and learn whatever I can learn. So I encourage people to check out that blog post. I'm just trying to put a disclaimer there. If you see something that seems wrong, it's probably wrong. <laughs> really wrong. <laughs> Cause you, yeah, you were figuring out along the way. Yeah. Well, no, I, 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 again, I appreciate you being on the program, sharing your knowledge, you know, attending our meetups and, and for everything that you do. Yeah. I definitely will point people in your direction and, uh, Look forward to maybe having you on the program in the future and well, we can talk great. more about what we've learned. So, well, thanks again, Miles. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. 
We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.